So, if you go ahead and just get a blank screen up here. Okay, so if I were to say simplify. And let's just say instead of having maybe a fraction times a fraction, I started throwing division into the mix. So maybe I had something like x squared minus 3x minus 4 over uh, 3 minus x times, and then maybe I had something like that on the bottom, or um, how about... And then it said divided by, and let's say you had something like, um, I don't know. So if you see something like this, and it says simplify, of course you're gonna say, well, what about parentheses, or what about exponents, or multiplication and division, and all that kind of stuff. And in the process of dividing, you might wanna to factor to see if something divides, but what are you doing when it says divided by? So to divide by that, I'm essentially just gonna flip it and change that to multiplication, right? Everybody knows that. What if it had this? in it. Now what is it telling you to do? So that is saying if each of these is to a negative one, that's saying to flip the fraction, right? That would take care of this, but then that's saying to flip it again, right? So essentially they're negating themselves or canceling themselves out. Are we good on that? Okay, I'm, I'm not going to put that negative one, but I just want to talk about that. Okay, so if I was cleaning this up, this is what I would do to go about this. I don't like taking a whole extra line just to flip that. So what I'm probably gonna do is say, all right, I'm flipping it to change this to multiplication. So that ends up on the top, but rather than just write four X minus 12, I'm gonna go ahead and factor the four out. So this basically comes up, and then this is gonna come down, and I'm gonna factor the five out, Right? And that will take care of that division and make a multiplication. And then while I'm going through this, this factors into an x minus 4, x plus 1. That's a 3 minus x. That is a x plus 3 squared. And that is an x plus 4, x minus 4. Right? And now that it's all multiplication, what are you doing? because it's a bunch of factors, right? Now there's pluses and minuses in there, joining the x and the four or the x and the three, but that just means the factors are a bunch of binomials and a couple of monomials mixed in there, right? So at this point, I'm gonna come in there and I'm gonna try to cancel anything that possibly cancels because I know that because I'm multiplying now, it's gonna end up all on the top and all on the bottom anyway, in the one giant fraction. So because it's multiplication, not addition, we're getting into addition today, so make sure you know, I can only cancel like this because I'm multiplying. So now that it's all multiplication, yes, I can cancel that, fa cancel that factor with that one. I can cancel one of those, leaving an x plus three with one of those. Is there anything else you see I can cancel? Cancel. If you pulled out a negative one in the bottom left, you could cancel that with the top right. I could, and remember what I said in the video yesterday? Yeah, you're, you can factor that negative one out if you want, but I just know anytime I have like an A minus B over a B minus A, like an X minus three over a three minus X. But you're at C. Oh, sorry. Over B minus A, yeah, you're gonna see that. I'm, again, I'm just coming out of the darkness. After this PSAT, my brain's still in mothball. Anytime you see that, you can just go ahead and cancel, put a negative one. But be careful, I mean, don't do that if you have like an A minus B 
over a B plus A, that's not the same thing, right? I'm talking about if the signs are opposites, negative B, positive B, positive A, negative A. If that's the case, then it will always cancel. So that and that would cancel and leave me a negative one, either on the top or the bottom. I just tend to like it on the top. So after that, I have nothing else to cancel, then I'm just gonna go, all right, I got a negative, I've got an X plus one, I've got an X plus three in the numerator, and a four, don't forget the four, so negative four. And then the denominator, I have a five and an X plus four. And I said yesterday in the video, even though technically simplify means to multiply and clean it all up, we're gonna go ahead and leave it like that. And the reason is, we normally simplify equations, like we're just, this is an expression that's a meaningless expression. But in the real math world, you're trying to solve things, solve problems. So if you had an expression set equal to zero, you would want to have it factored. So a lot of times we do have to simplify so that we can factor, but since this is already factored up, we're not going to go any further than this. We're fine leaving it like this on your test. In fact, if you bother to take the time to multiply all that out, I'm not even going to look at it. I, I literally am going to quit looking right here. Y'all with me? Okay. And then one last thing. What if you had something like this? Um, what is this saying and what is the significance of these these division signs or these fraction signs being longer than the other, some longer than the other. It's order. So it's, it's giving you an order of operations, right? This longer means that I'm looking at that as a fraction and that as a fraction. Now this all changes if I do something like this. If I did something like this, now I'm talking about the bottom part has to be simplified separately from this top part. Are y'all seeing that? So in this case, I would be like, oh, well, since that's the longest and that's the next longest, it kind of groups that together. So you may see problems like this. I'll give you one in a second. I might have put one on the video. But be careful about this, that you're actually looking at the lengths of those signs. But on this particular one, if I do that, you're essentially going, oh, if this is the biggest, I'm grouping this and this. So this divided by this, what would you do? How do I divide by that fraction? I multiply by a reciprocal. So to divide by that, I am going to multiply by the reciprocal of this. Are you with me? Yes, no? And at this point, I would factor the top, factor the bottom, factor the top, cancel everything that cancel. Let me give you an idea about this other one I was just kind of mentioning. What if I had something like this? So if you're simplifying this, where's the biggest fraction? I mean, the biggest fraction bar? Right there? So that's breaking the top and the bottom into two separate sections, these two and these three. Now, of the top part, where's the biggest? That. So that's making this group together. You gotta do that first. Once you get that, then you do this. And then because that's bigger, you're gonna do this. And then once you get that done, you're gonna, to divide by this, you're gonna multiply by our reciprocal. So let's see if we can do that. First, very innermost parentheses, what would this give me? 15 and 12. So 3. So all of that, I'm going to leave the 12 there. I'm going to make that an x cubed. And then I'm going to draw a big bar. And then what's x cubed over x to the fourth? 1 over x. 1 over x. All right, now I've got it down to a fraction over a fraction. What's x to the 12 over x cubed? x to the ninth. But I still have that big bar and the 1 over x. So I have to divide by the one over x by, by multiplying by reciprocal. So to divide by this, 
I multiply by the reciprocal x over 1. And what's x to the 9th times x? x to the 10th. x to the 10th. And if I change these bars and make them different sizes, I get a totally different answer. You have to pay attention to those. All right? And I put that as a test question every year. It's like I can even see it. Front page, bottom, right corner. It's just there every time. Sometimes I break it up into something a little bit more. Sometimes it's like eight levels with all kinds of different length bars. So you really got to pay attention. All right. Well, that's um, if you can do that, you're going to be in good shape. If you notice, the factoring is not all that bad, is it? On most of the problems, it's basic uh, trinomial stuff, difference of two squares. Still recording? Okay. Am I getting text or something? Yeah. No, no. Alright. Hopefully there's no compromising on stuff getting attached to my phone. Alright, so um, if you want to turn with me to... Is your book empty or are we... Almost done. Yeah. Okay, this says page 11, so this must have been at one point covered later or something. And I've never changed the page. 109? Okay, so check, go to 109. It should say notes, adding and subtracting rational expressions. And it's funny to me how when we start doing this, I'm going to expose. Uh, a little bit of you here. I'll show you why. Okay, so what we're going to be doing right now is instead of adding fractions, I'm sorry, instead of multiplying fractions together, which we all know when we multiply fractions, you just multiply the numerators, multiply the denominators, <clears throat> and you end up with one fraction, right? You don't have to have common denominators. You don't have to have any of that stuff. You just multiply the numerators and the denominators. And if you can cancel something ahead of time, great. With addition and subtraction, that is not the case. And you can't come in here and go, oh, I can cancel 5 out here and here. That doesn't work. That little cross-canceling junk that people always use that expression, that doesn't work across negatives and positives. It just, it's not an operation. All right? So when we're adding and subtracting, the rules for adding and subtracting are you have to have a what? A common denominator. And if you do have a common denominator, the, de uh, the common denominator doesn't change, right? Once you have that common denominator, you just write it down, and then you add up or subtract to the numerators, right? So most of you have no problem looking at stuff like 1 8 and 5 6 and going, oh, yeah, I know the common denominator. And you'll either come up with something like 48 or 24 or something like that. And what we like to have is the least common denominator. Because a common denominator, although it here would not be a big deal, because in the very end we go, oh, I got 46 over 48, you would just reduce it. But when you don't pick the least common denominator on one of these, you end up with bigger powers of x. Now this one, the least one is really the only one you're gonna probably find. But you will find at times if you don't pick the least common denominator, which is the same thing as the LCM. LCM we talked about, if you don't pick that, then when, when you're done adding all this up, sometimes you end up with a numerator and the power is so big, you can't factor it. Like your factoring rules won't apply. Are you tracking with me? And if your factoring rules won't apply because it's too big, it's beyond your, your uh, pay grade right now, then you won't know how to factor it to see if anything else cancels. So it's a really big deal that you find the LCM. Now, what was the rule on the LCM? Again, a lot of people look at this and go, hey, 16, 24, that's not going to be as easy on some of these. And you're going to see what I'm talking about as we move through this. Remember what we did? If it wasn't really easy to see it, we wrote out the prime factorization, 2 cubed, 2 times 3, and we took what? The highest power of every factor present. So I'm going to have a 2 cubed and a 3 in my common denominator. So when you look over here, you want to make sure that these are completely factored. These are. But if they weren't, factor them. And then you want the highest power of the x minus 2, the highest power of the x, and the highest power of the x plus 1. Now you don't see this in your notes because it's all black and white. But you can see where I have said, okay, that means I need all three of these in my common denominator which means here I had to put an additional x and an x plus 1 on the bottom. Well, what do you got to do to balance that out then? 
multiply the top as well by x and x plus 1. To make this work, I already had an x. I needed an additional x minus 2, x plus 1 multiplied. Well, then i got to multiply the top by that. And then here, I already had the x plus 1, but I needed an x and an x minus 2. And at this point, you're going to suffer a little bit, okay? You're going to have to take this 5x and distribute it in. You're going to have to take that, be careful here, the positive 1, because that sign is going to be important. In this case, it didn't matter, but um, take that positive 1 and multiply it in by whatever I get right here, which ended up being x squared minus x minus uh, 2, and then plus 1 times that. Here, I'm going to have to take that negative 4x and multiply it in. Actually, I left the negative here, and you can see I just took the 4x in there, but I could put the negative in there as well and change that to a plus. That's going to be your call. And you can see right here, when I brought that down, what did I do? I took this, plus this, and then I went minus all of that. And in subtracting all of that, I had to change the signs, didn't I? So negative 4x squared, positive 8x. In fact, if y'all want, it might not be a bad idea to go, you know what? I'm going to multiply that in and get negative 4x squared uh, plus 8x and then just make that a positive because you already multiplied the negative in. And that way you're just adding junk and it might be easier and less careless. And then you just add up your like terms. And then the last thing I'm going to look at is would it possibly help me to factor? Because remember, simplify, whatever if we're simplifying, there's no F for factor, but could it possibly help me? Divide. Yeah, it might help me divide. And there are some binomials down here. So maybe I just for a second go, well, I, I could take definitely take a 2 out. That would give me that. But then when I look at this, I go, you know what, that's prime, isn't it? So if that's prime, it's not going to factor. I just go back to what I have. And again, I don't have to foil out the factors. I don't. But it is worth checking. I, on every test I've ever given, I think, I have problems like that where in the end, at least one of them will factor and an additional thing will cancel. So always remember, if it's possible, for it to factor and help you cancel, then you would want to do it. So let's see if you can process all that. Do a couple of examples and we'll just continue to get uh, more and more involved in these. So start with number one. I want to find a common denominator so that I may add and subtract these numbers. So to find a common denominator, which is the least common multiple, what do you do? Greatest amount of each of them. The greatest power of every factor if you if the uh, factorization is prime. prime. Now listen, don't, don't kill yourself. I mean, if you see a 6, 3, and a 1, what's the numerical part of the denominator going to be? 6. So if you see that part, great. You don't have to go 2 times 3 and 3. I mean, if you can see the numerical part, which a lot of you can pretty quickly, great. So I already know that the numerical part's 6. So I have 6a squared. I have 3b squared, and I have ab. So here in the brown is my original problem. And in the blue here, I am going to change what needs to be changed. Now my LCM, I can look at it and see that it's going to be 6. And how many a's and b's am I going to have to have? A squared, b squared. A squared, b squared, because that's the highest power of a, highest power of b. So I have to transform all my LCMs to be 6 a squared, b squared. So I'm going to have to multiply the bottom by a b squared and the top on the first fraction. I'm going to have to multiply this to get to 6a squared b squared. What do I multiply by? A 2, two a squared. and an a squared. And to get the, the last fraction to be 6a squared b squared, I need a 6 on the top and the bottom, as well as a what? Another a and another b. So another A there makes it squared, and an A on top, and another B there makes it squared, and a B on top. And that leaves me B squared plus 2A squared minus 12AB all over 6A squared B squared. Now, there is something called decreasing degree of X, or decreasing degree of A which means if you have a polynomial and you can take one of the powers and make it go down in value, it's prettier. It's not a life or death situation, but it's like chewing with your mouth open. You know, it's just kind of rude and company. 
right? Even though in some cultures, they say chewing with your mouth open shows that you really enjoy the flavor. And you smack to show your appreciation. And I, I've actually heard that you bring in more oxygen chewing with your mouth open and your flavors are enhanced. But here in the States, we chew with our mouth closed, right? We try. Over four. So anyway, on this one, it might be better, uh, prettier, if I started with like a 2A squared, A to the second, then went to A to the first term, which is 12AB, and then went to the no A term. So that would probably look a little better, but it's not, again, life or death situation. And why do you think I didn't bother to factor that top part? in addition to the fact that it didn't factor. But why did I not even look at it to see if it factored? So you're not gonna end up with a, a six or an A squared or a B squared all the way. Yeah, trinomials factor into what? Binomials. binomials. And I don't even have a binomial. And there's no monomial that comes out. Now, if, if that B squared term had like a two or a four or an A or something in it, and I could take a two out and cancel a two, or if they all had an A and I could pull an A out and cancel an A, great. But right here, this is not gonna, help me, so I'm not even thinking to try to factor. All right, what about number two? Now here, <laughs> I hate to even show you this example, except I want to show you, not to implant it with maybe a way you could do this, but I mean, without fail, every year I have somebody go, common denominator, all right? I got a y squared plus a one, so I'm going to multiply by a y and add a one. And they do that. And I can sense their exuberance and their happiness inside, but it is a colossal just destruction of this problem, okay? We don't want to do that. We got to think. LCM. Now, how do I, if I want to add these, I got to have a common denominator, which is an LCM. What are my rules for LCM? So you got to factor it first. How do I factor y squared plus 1? Plus and minus. Why? It's prime because it's a sum of squares. So it is factored. That's as much as I can do. Literally, that is the factor. If it factored more, I'd do it. If it was a y squared minus one, I'd go y plus one minus minus one. Doesn't factor. So that's a factor, and that's a factor. So when it comes to actually finding the common denominator here, what am I gonna have to multiply that by? Why? A y, because the highest power of each factor. So this is going to need a y. And what is this going to need? Uh, y a y squared plus 1. So sometimes the factors are monomials. Sometimes the factors are ugly binomials. You just got to stick to your rules. And don't let algebra 2.5 come in and mess with you. Which is, oh, maybe I can add something to it. You can't do that. That's... That's not how you found an LCM. Prime factorization, highest power of every factor. If it's not completely obvious to you. So at this point, I got what? I got a 2y, and then I got to take this negative 5 and distribute it in. So negative 5y squared, negative 5, all of that over y and a y squared plus 1. Now, if I want to make it pretty, yes. Negative 5y squared, positive 2y minus 5, all of that over. And I want you to give me an argument for or against me trying or attempting to factor that. Should I or should I not? No. Why not? There's a y squared in the top. And the bottom is a binomial, the same power. So I'm translating that to say, if this did factor, it would have a something y and something y in it, right? If it did, now it would be a negative five or five and a negative one, negative five and one, or something like that. But it would be a single y and a single y, and that only has a chance of canceling with that, but that has a y squared, so there really is no way that's gonna cancel, is it? And if there's no way you're gonna cancel it, then just stop right there. Why don't you multiply it into a y cube? You can, but remember I said if you didn't want to, if you wanted to just leave the factors like they were, you could. But technically speaking, y cubed plus y would be completely simplified uh, on that. All right, what about three and four? Let's look at three first. And this is where people start getting, maybe not start, but this is where people make a lot of mistakes. A lot of people make this mistake. They go, okay, 
That's one factor, that's the other factor. And they come over here and they go, all right, don't copy this down. They go, I gotta multiply that by this, and I gotta multiply this by this. And in doing that, you know what you just found? That's right, you found a common denominator. And the problem with this common denominator is, and this one you're gonna probably survive it, but this common denominator sometimes ends up with a power so big on the top you don't know how to factor it. Like you'll get an x cubed thing or an x to the fourth with five terms and you're like, I don't know how to factor five for Paul number. So not to mention you're making it harder on yourself in the long run because you're gonna to have to factor all this junk out to find out what cancels. So avoid that by going, wait a minute, I haven't found the least common multiple. I've just found a, to find the least common multiple, what do I do? Factor them first. So here an x comes out. And here you have a difference of squares. Right? So if these are my fractions, and I'll, I'll recopy them. 5 over x, x minus 1, and 1 over x plus 1, x minus 1. What do I do to find the common denominator? The greatest of each. Thing. Greatest of each. So I need x, I need an x, this one doesn't have it, so I'm going to write over here. So my least common multiple will have an x in it. What else? X minus one. An x minus 1 and an x plus one. x plus 1. It's got to have that. Now this one already has the first two, so I'm going to tack on an x plus 1. And then this one already has the x plus 1, x minus 1, so I'm going to multiply by an x. And again, I don't have to multiply all this junk out, so I'm going to now keep the common denominator. And for the numerator, 5x plus 5, positive 1x, so plus x. So I end up with 6x plus 5 over x, x minus 1, x plus 1. And do I need to bother? Is anything going to cancel here? No. Now, if that had been 6x plus 6, right, and you factor 6 out, you got an x plus 1, the x plus 1's would cancel. But it's not, so I can't. Not too bad? Number 4. Now, again, every year I have somebody in this class, multiple people, who will go. They'll multiply the first term by an x minus 2, they multiply the second one by an x squared minus 4, and then they end up with more work to do in the end. But we're going to find the least common multiple first. So we're going to factor that. That's already factored. So what would be my LCM here? x plus 2, x minus 2. x plus 2, x minus 2. So this one already has the LCM. And this one just needs an additional x plus 2. So, keep the common denominator. And I get 4 minus 3 times that. So, negative 3x, negative 6. Right? Mm -hmm. So, what do I end up with? Negative 3x minus 2 over x plus 2x minus 2. I'm listening. It's super easy to multiply the bottom together. Like, if you're looking at that and you're like, oh, that's x squared minus 4. Well, you, you're welcome to do it. I'm just telling you I don't need you to do that. Feeling good? Number 5. What's going on here? Negative exponents. Now, let me show you the wrong way to do this. 2x to the negative 1y minus 2xy to the negative 1. Every year I have people go, oh, wait. They draw a line and they go, I can take that x to the negative 1 and make it a positive 1. And I can take that y to the negative 1 and make it a y to the positive 1. And they end up with 2y minus 2x over xy. Now, I can move something down to the bottom or flip it if it's nothing but multiplication. Is this nothing but multiplication? No. Is this part 
nothing but multiplication. Yes. Yeah. So on this one, I can move it down. And on this one, separate from this, I can move that part down. But I can't think of it as one big term and just drop it to the bottom. Does that make sense? Now, had this been a minus, I mean a times right there, well, then sure, it's all multiplication. I can just swing it down, swing it down. But it's not. So, what do I do here? What stays in the numerator? 2y. And the x goes to the denominator, drop down the minus. Here, 2x, y goes to the denominator. And now, what do you have? Unlike denominators. So what do you do? LCM. And what is your LCM? XY. So I need another Y there, which will square the top. I need an X there, which squares the top. And I end up with 2Y squared minus 2X squared over XY. And as tempting as it is to factor that numerator, is there any need to do it? Yeah. No, because if you factor a 2 out, which is what you ought to do first, the 2 is not canceling. And then you're left with the difference of two squares, which factors into two binomials, which there's no binomials on the bottom to cancel. So again, don't factor it if you don't need to, only if you've got a shot of dividing it. All right, now, do you remember this kind of problem? We've been doing them off and on all year, where it says find the values of A and B that makes the problem true. And what does that mean? Uh, makes it true. Another way of wording would be, Find the values of A and B that makes this an identity. What is an identity? We talked about these like on the first day. So the right side equals the left side. That's what it means. So evidently, there's some value of A and some value of B here that if I found a common denominator and added all this up, I would get this. Well, to do that, what do you think you might want to do to compare those? Yeah, this already has a what in it. You might not notice it, but this already has a an x minus 3 and an x plus 2. Well, amazing. All right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add the right side together, and I'm going to show you a better way to do it. I'm going to add those two terms together and then compare the left and the right and see how it would have to match up. So right here, if I multiply the a by what? An x plus 2 on the top and the bottom, that first term. And I'll multiply this B expression by x minus, three. x minus 3 on the top and the bottom. That leaves me with A, x plus 2, plus B, x minus 3, equals this. Right? Now, I'm going to multiply that right side out just to get it cleaned up. AX plus 2A plus BX minus 3B over X plus 2, X plus 3. Now, I have a question for you. If this is an identity, which means the left and the right sides have to be equal, they have to be equal, what does that tell you about your X terms here and your X terms here? If this is an identity, it has to be equal. Don't these two things have to add up to give me that? Yes. So that would mean 2x would have to be equal to ax plus bx. And if that's going to be true for every power of x, then ignore the x's or divide the x's out, and you get 2 equals a plus b, which sadly I can't solve for one value, but tap the brakes and see what else happens. Then what do I know about the non-x terms? Doesn't that essentially tell me that the negative 9 must be equal to these whatever's left over there? So that means that the negative 9 has to be equal to the 2a minus the 3b. And what do you have now? System. I have a system. And if I have a system, now I can solve it. Right? Now, it's not wonderful. It doesn't bring me joy inside. And I'm going to show you a trick on this in a second. But I can do it, right? So let's just say I used linear combination and I slid the two over there. Okay, and then maybe I multiplied the top and the bottom by a three. 
I get negative 9 equals 2a minus 3b, and then I get 6 equals 3a plus 3b. The b's cancel, and I get 5a equals negative 3, and my a is negative 3 fifths. Algebra, 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 right? If I didn't make an error. Are y'all with me? And then what do I do with the negative 3 fifths? Plug it back in to maybe right there and say, all right, if I plug it back in, I get 2 equals negative 3 fifths plus b. So b is 2 plus a 3 fifths, which is what? 13 fifths. And there's my a and there's my b that made that true. Now, who wants to know a sweet trick that will shave almost all of this work off? Now, you know that when you're adding fractions, the only way to do it is find a common denominator. And to make a common denominator, you have to multiply some of those denominators by something. But you can't just wander around multiplying stuff by stuff because it changes its value. So on a fraction, how do I multiply the denominator without changing the value? Multiply the numerator as well. Now, on isolated terms, that's what you do. Right? You multiply the top and the bottom by it, and it's the same as multiplying by 1. Now, if it's an equation, though, that has two sides, and they're in balance with an equal, you don't have to multiply the top and the bottom. You can multiply both sides of an equation. So check this out. Rather than find a common denominator and do what I did here, what if I said, hey, the common denominator clearly and you can see it, is x minus 3x plus 2, right? What if I multiplied the left and the right by x minus 3, x plus 2? Check it out. And don't take shortcuts on this. Your shortcuts, if you have a 95 or better average, take your shortcuts because you're doing it wrong. If you don't, don't take a shortcut. People try to memorize stuff, and I see it on the work, and I'm like, shortcut, shortcut. And they're just getting hammered because they don't really get what's going on. Watch. I'm going to multiply the left side by x minus 3, x plus 2. That's this left side of the equation. And I'm going to multiply the right side by x minus 3, x plus 2. Now, when I multiply the right side by a binomial, what do I have to do? I have to distribute all that in, don't I? So to save a little time, and maybe let, make it look a little better, I'm just going to multiply both terms by x minus 3, x plus 2. You all with me on this? Now write that. And then, unless you've got a 95 or better average and you don't make errors. And then, cancel what cancels? What cancels here? Everything. Everything. Except the 2x minus 9. What cancels here? X minus 3. So bring down the a and the x plus 2. And the plus. What cancels here? Plus 2. And now I have b and x minus 3. And if you look back at the work that you just did, that was the numerator of, of your two fractions, wasn't it? Okay? Took a lot less time to get there, though, didn't it? Now, here's the real magic. You could keep doing this problem the same way at this point, because you, you would just ignore the numerators. But check this out. What if, didn't we say that we're finding the a and b that works for any x? Right? So if I can plug in any x value, and these sh this should be true. What if I get clever and go, all right, if any x should be true here, then why don't I pick, pick an x that makes one of the a's or one of the b's go away? Like, for instance, what if I just said, let x equal negative 2? If I plug a negative 2 in there, what happens? I get 0a. It's gone. If I plug a negative 2 in there, what do I get? Negative 5b. Five. Negative five and if I plug a negative 2 in there, what do I get? All right, b equals 13 fifths. Well, that was nice. And then what if I do it again and go, what if I let x equal positive 3? What does that do here? Three. Negative 3, positive 3 there, 5a, positive 3 there, uh, 0b, a is negative 3 fifths. Isn't that a lot less work than what I just did? So simple that way. Huge math team question. You see it all the time. I mean, all, not all the time, like every question, but I mean like you know, at least a couple times a year, two or three times a year, you'll see something like this. Now I can make them harder than that, but not in algebra two. 
and creek out will make them a little nastier. So your decimals become harder to do. But there's still strategies to get them done quickly and to keep from having to take seven lines like I did. You know what I'm saying? Okay. Keep plugging away. All right, what about this? This is gonna be one of the biggest tricks you use in trig. When you're dealing with trig, you are gonna many, many times be stuck with situations where you have fractions within fractions. And the old school method of doing it is, well, let's find a common denominator and add up that numerator. And you can see that I, I did that here, common denominator, adjusted the numerators, added them together and got a fraction. And then here, oh, five and nine, to add those two fractions, common denominator to be 45, adjust the numerators accordingly, get another fraction, and then like we did earlier today, how do you take a fraction and divide by a fraction? You multiply by the reciprocal. At that point, it's just multiplication, so you can cancel stuff, like I canceled a three out there and there, and did it, and you finally are done. But I got a better plan, and it works so much better. Look at this original problem, and instead of doing what I just did there, or this original problem, ask yourself, what would be the common denominator of the two, the three, the five, and the nine? Like for a second, pretend I was adding all four of those. What would your common denominator be? And a lot of times you can eyeball. Y'all see that it's 90? If you don't, then change the 90 to a three squared. Highest power of everything would be one, two, three twos, and a five, and there's your 90. Instead of doing this, multiply the top and the bottom by 90. And check it out. When I multiply the top and the bottom, which you can do, right? Because it's a fraction, it's like multiplying by one, and you distribute it in. So it's the same thing as like basically multiplying a 90 by each of these terms. Check it out. Two, 90 cancels, one times 45, bam. Three, 90 cancels, one times 30, 30, bam. Five and 90 goes in there 18 times, two times 18, 36. 9 and 90 cancels 10, 10 times 1, 10, add it, done. And look how much easier that was. And you're going to do this all of the time when you're simplifying with trig identities, which you guys won't do until the, you know, April and May, but um, you'll see this kind of stuff a good bit. So when you see fractions inside of fractions, even when they start getting ugly like 9 and 10, Okay. Even though they start getting ugly like 9 and 10, remember that you have this option. So I'm going to skip number 7 since we just did one just like that. Look at number 8. Can you look at this? Since I have a fraction inside of another fraction and I'm adding and subtracting and all that stuff, right? Rather than find a common denominator and add these, subtract these, subtract these, and then multiply by reciprocal, rather than do that, what would be the common denominator of all four of these? X. X, then multiply the top and the bottom by x, and then just distribute it in. So what's x times the x? x squared. x squared. What's x times the one over x? One. Negative one. What's x times the one? X. What's x times the negative one over x? Uh, negative. And that looks better already. Am I finished? No. No, because now I know that the numerator factors a little bit more and now I can cancel. Not too bad. Try number nine for size. When the bell rings, we'll let it ring. What about here? Can you look? Fractions within fractions, added and subtracted together. What a mess. Do you really want to find a common denominator and add these, and a common denominator and add these, and then multiply by the reciprocal? No. What is the common denominator of that, 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 and that? x squared y squared, so I'm going to multiply the top by an x squared y squared, and the bottom by an x squared y squared, and then I'm going to distribute it in. So let's carefully do that here. What would x squared y squared times 1 over x squared give me? Just y squared, right? The x squareds cancel and you get 1 y squared, or just y squared. Bring down the negative. What's x squared y squared times a negative 1 over y squared? Well, we'll cancel here. The y squared is leaving you negative 1x squared, or x squared, negative x squared. Y'all seen it? What's this times this term? What cancels? 
x squared. x squared, leaving you one y squared. What's this times the middle term? What cancels? X one. One of the x's, one of the y's, leaving you with what? Two. Positive two, and then the other x and the other y. And then when you multiply this by that, the y squareds cancel, leaving you one x squared. Man, it looks better already. Should I bother trying to factor this? Yes. yes. I'm thinking yes. The top part factors into y minus x, y plus x. The bottom part factors into y plus x squared. Right? Did anything cancel at that point? No, the y plus x. One of the y plus x's leaving me a y minus x over a y plus x. And can I cancel these? Do they leave me a negative one? People try to make this negative one sometimes. They go, well, yeah, you could. You could take a negative out. Well, if I take a negative out, they both change signs. Is that the opposite of this? Remember, the a minus b, b minus a have to be opposite y's. That's true. Also, opposite x's, not true. So that's, it's not going to help you there. Remember, it has to be opposite x's, opposite y's there. So let me stop right there. The bell's about to ring. This domain in the zeros, that's just a reminder of what we did yesterday in the, in the video. So if you didn't see that in the video, go back and watch that. But x squared minus 9 is greater than 0. Uh, for the domain, yes, the x squared minus the 9 part, because that's the part underneath, it has to be greater than or, or equal to 0. But because it's in the denominator, it can't be 0. And be careful about this. Hey, x squared minus 9, check this out. If I say this, can I add 9 to square root both sides? You think you can, but do you remember how to do problems like this from the last test? Mark the negative 3, mark the 3, open circles, and then what? Check, check, check. If all I do is this, check out how this messes me up. If I square root both sides and go x is bigger than plus or minus 3, you are wrong. Because remember, when you square root both sides, guess what this becomes? Absolute value. And now you have a greater problem. Are you with me on that? The best thing to do is to find these roots on an inequality, mark them, and then check. If I plug a zero in here, not true. If I plug a negative four or a positive four, is true. So the domain on this actually ends up being everything from negative infinity to negative three and from three and beyond. Which kind of makes sense because that would make sure that this stays positive. And then how do you find the zeros? Set the top equal to zero. Set the top equal to zero. And when I do that, for zeros, you get x minus 4, x plus 1. So you get 4 and negative 1 as your zeros, right? Wrong. Why? Can't be negative 1. Can't be negative 1 because it's not even in the domain. It's not even possible. Say what? Oh, yeah, you're right. Go. Thank you. You're right. You man. Bye, Mr. Hurley. See you, man. Have a good one.